Fabry disease is a rare genetic condition caused by pathogenic disease-causing variants in a gene called GLA. That gene encodes an enzyme called uh, alpha-galactosidase that is involved in how we break down certain uh, metabolites in the lysosome, which is kind of a part of the cell that acts as a, a recycling bin. And the disease, because of that difficulty, leads to storage of these kind of parts that don't get broken down and, and gets categorized as what's called a lysosomal storage disease. So there's a number of a number of organ systems that get affected, and that is what ends up causing so many specialists to be involved. I think the ones we think of the most often are probably the kidney and the heart, but it, we also see issues in the brain and nervous system, the skin and the eyes. And then more recently, we've, there have been some studies showing some major issues with hearing or, or uh, the audiologic system. And, and it really depends on type of Fabry disease and also if they're male or female. So I, I would say it's males, at least with the classic type, tend to present in childhood or adolescence, uh, most frequently with things like uh, reduced sweating, pains in their extremities, and things called angiokeratomas, which are small uh, reddish skin uh, markings that we see. Sometimes, depending on how early or how late they've been caught, you may already start to see some of the kidney issues with proteinuria and GI issues like chronic abdominal pain. With females, it's a lot more difficult because they because it's an X-linked disorder and because there's variation in which organs express which gene, you tend to see uh, anywhere from asymptomatic throughout their entire life to more frequently at least having some milder symptoms presenting later in life. And I would say more commonly what you're seeing with them is uh, the chronic abdominal pain, something called corneal verticillata, which is an eye finding. And in some cases, the uh, kidney issues and heart issues, depending on how late you've caught them. There was a, a study in 2004 that I think looked at the path to diagnosis from the time of symptom onset. It was on average 10 to 15 years. And I don't think that's changed much even in the last decade or so. Again, it can vary depending on what, what symptoms are going to show up. I would say in females, I think the most often specialty we get referrals from is ophthalmology because they might, uh, you know, might be getting seen for some vision issues and the corneal verticillata will get noticed. For a more classic male, we've had referrals from a nephrologist. I would say dermatology is quite common where they've caught the, derma, uh, the angiokeratomas and have kind of gotten diagnosed and sent to us for that direction. Um, and sometimes neurology, depending on if they're having significant nerve pain in their extremities. You know, typically by the time they get to me, someone's probably already at least thought of it. So oftentimes we're using molecular studies or enzyme analysis um, if we feel like once we've seen them, they have symptoms that are consistent with the disorder. I, I think that may change over time as we're starting to see newborn screening show up in some of these states where Fabry is going to be caught in infants who are clearly going to not have symptoms yet, um, in which case we'll be seeing them much earlier, but the diagnosis will pretty much be the same with enzyme analysis and uh, molecular analysis. Males, especially males with more classic variants, tend to present in that childhood and adolescent period, so we're, we're seeing symptoms earlier. There are more atypical forms that may present with uh, more cardiac issues later in life, in which case it can be several decades, even for the males, although that's less common. And again, females, I've seen presentations anywhere from the teens up into the 50s or 60s before they have really been caught with symptoms. Um, so it varies uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's even uh, that that's with both classic and atypical uh, later onset forms. That would be most states in the United States are not yet doing newborn screening. Um, and even with newborn screening, you're probably going to miss some females since most of the screening will be done with enzyme analysis. But I'd say the biggest issue and, and the biggest or the best way to start shortening some of that diagnostic odyssey that they go through is probably just increasing the awareness of Fabry since it is a rare disease. Most people who are going to see them first before they ever get to genetics who need to be the people suspecting it and sending those referrals probably are not thinking about Fabre as much as we do here in genetics. Um, and so just having it on the differential and having a good understanding of what some of those symptoms are for people who, you know, primary care or nephrology, um, ophthalmology, increasing that awareness would be the best way to do that. I think 
some of the best ways is just, you know, having having a relationship with some of those specialties outside between us and, you know, between genetics um, or other specialties who have experience with Febre and, and just trying to raise awareness, you know, with our own relationships with other providers in the area. But any sort of, you know, educational programs that can be targeted at conferences that they may go to or even just community educational programs, ways to get providers involved and to think more about this disorder um, especially with the variable presentation would, I think, help immensely in reducing that diagnostic odyssey. At what point do you typically see a patient in your care cycle? So I, I think with the males, it's, again, typically probably more in adolescence, even if they've had onset in childhood, we're not going to see them because it takes so long typically for it to be recognized, you know, usually within five to 10 years. By that time, they're probably having fairly significant symptoms. So I usually think they're probably on the more moderate to severe side. With females, again, because their presentations vary so much, at least for initial diagnoses, it's it's usually pretty late. They usually have a significant issue in at least one of the organ systems, which is how they kind of got diagnosed in the first place. And the other way is that if someone else in the family got diagnosed with Fabre, we typically find several other members who are affected, and we will see people who may not have symptoms yet at that point. It, it really cannot be understated how long many of our female patients have gone with symptoms that got, you know, unrecognized. I would say most frequently I'm seeing people in their 30s or and 40s, and typically they have fairly significant symptoms at that point. And I think because some of these symptoms are not the most common things that we think of with that brace, since females typically are not, not as likely to have, say, the angiokeratomas that are more easily recognized, they may not have as much of the pain crises that we typically see in males and think of, that they often kind of fly under the radar. Um, and a lot of the symptoms, if you think about it with Fabre, uh, you know, a lot of the other symptoms are things that you may naturally see as people get older, like chronic abdominal pain, or there may be other causes that uh, providers will want, want to rule out first. Hearing loss, sweating is not something a lot of people talk about. So whether they sweat or not may not even come up in most conversations. And so I think it, what happens is people oftentimes as doctors, we look for the most common cause of whatever symptom we're seeing and we work those up first. And Fabre is usually much further down the list than most of the other common causes of some of these uh, symptoms. And so females just kind of progressively take longer to work up because their symptoms are both milder and later onset than we typically see with males. Mm -hmm.